Good afternoon, early evening. I'm Taryn. <laughs> I'm an addict. Taryn. Yeah. I thought this would get easier after the first year, and it doesn't, because I can feel my heart like here, like beating. It's, it's difficult, but, you know, I'm carrying a message. I'm not, you know, it's difficult sharing my journey with everyone because it's quite intimidating sharing to a room of different people how I messed up. You know, because I'm a perfectionist, I'm an addict, I want everything. I don't want no one to know my imperfections. But yeah, that's all up to my higher power, hey? Um, I think, I didn't do this by myself. I think my higher power for another day, um, clean. And I thank all my friends in the fellowship and the fellowship of NA for getting me here because I tried to do it by myself beforehand and it was messy. You know, um, so yeah, how it was, um, I always share about my first defects, where, where I picked up my first character defect, I uh, was, yeah, let's just start from the beginning, I jump around a lot, because I've got, oh, my brain is everywhere, but um, I, I grew up in a very good, loving home, family, my parents did everything for me. Um, they sacrificed a lot and I, I went without nothing. I had everything that I needed and more. And when I was, yeah, I had a little brother. And then when I was eight years old, we, I had another little brother who, unfortunately, he passed. He, we, he had an accident. And, yeah, this is where, that's because I share this, because without drugs, I had defects and I'm still an addict without drugs. So, like, yeah, he had an accident and I didn't cry and I learned how to put on a, a front, you know. Um, everyone came to me, I was a little girl, and everyone affirmed me for not crying and said how brave I was. And I, there started my dishonesty from when I was eight years old. You know, I picked up that character defect and I, I kept it with me. But then from there on, um, we grew up in, in Joburg. And then when I was about eight, nine, we moved to Durban. And it was tough because I made my friends in school and I had my little, you know, make circle of friends and all of that. And I had to redo that again when I came to Durban. And I didn't really, I was uncomfortable. I didn't, I liked to isolate. As a kid, I liked to say to my teacher, I don't like to sit next to someone else. I like to be by myself. I didn't I didn't have time for anyone else like I was very selfish I didn't want to be around people I didn't like that so I was a little bit of a loner I was friends with everyone but I wasn't really I was like a, a wild card I, I fit into all the different groups but I wasn't really you know one of the groups and um, this all changed when I went when I went to school in Durban one of the popular girls moms was friends with my mom and then all of a sudden they started coming up to me and all my friends that are I've made friends with the, the more academic girls the nerdy girls if you want to call them that but um, and then I started this whole popular thing and I started becoming one of the popular girls and I kind of learned how to apply masks to myself because they were they went they went against some of the things that my mom and my dad taught me as manners, as uh, an upbringing. Um, they, they used to be rebellious, they used to do all these different things, and to fit in, I had to be, I had to be one of them, you know. I had to wear the designer clothes, I had to wear, I had to go to the parties, and I had to, you know, do all of that stuff. And it just, you know, and also through school, I also got attention by being a rebel. So whatever the rules were, I thought it was a game at one point. I was breaking all the rules and I got attention from that stuff, you know. And this kind of rocket, rocketed me off into high school where I had my first drink and I was at one of my best friend's parties and yeah, I wanted to see what it was about and I wanted to rebel as well. And I got off my face wasted and I made a total fool of myself. And instead of being reprimanded, 
um, the next day, everyone gave me affirmation and told me how cool I was because I was saying all these things and I was off the, I was mad. And I kind of hold on to that, um, you know. And when I did have that first sip of alcohol, um, all those insecurities, like they say, everything, everything slipped away. I wasn't like self-obsessed. I wasn't shy. I was the best dancer, you know, and I was friends with everyone and I was the most attractive, you know, which really isn't true. <laughs> drunk people are, yeah, special. Anyway, um, I am a drunk, I was a drunk person. I can still be a drunk person. I never had to lose sight of that. But yeah, then came the spark of rebellion through school where instead of excelling and concentrating on work and stuff, in my diary, I didn't have all my test dates. I had all the parties, you know, and I knew the parties and I knew the people, I knew the DJ. Um, you speak to Taryn, she'll hook you up. Um, yeah, I was seen as, and I thought this was cool because I thought this was kind of gangster. You know, I was always the bad child and I was always, <clears throat> I always knew all these things. And it didn't, like people weren't laughing. I, now in recovery, I realize people weren't laughing <coughs> with me when I was intoxicated or on drugs. They were laughing at me. And yeah, um, I realize all of this now, but in that moment at school, I thought I was the shit. And that's where I learned all my masks. It was the party girl. Then um, I learned that if I was aggressive and I looked disturbed and I was like this artist chick, um, people would leave me alone because I'm like this crazy artist chick. And I went through all these like different faces and I, I could present myself in different social settings. And if I wanted something, if I wanted help with schoolwork, I would go be all sophisticated with the, the academic people. Or if I wanted to be cool and seen, I would go to the party people and say, check, this party's happening, you know. And through all these facades and masks that I kind of put in my little cupboard for each day that I wanted to present myself, I lost myself because I didn't actually know who I was because I had so many different images. I didn't know what my own image was. And I was so busy trying to fit in and be accepted and chase acceptance rather than, you know, being comfortable with myself. Because I wasn't, I had to be something in order to fit in. And yeah, after school, uh, I chose to go to chef school. Um, and then I saw all the work involved. I thought it was just fun. You get into the kitchen, you cook a few things, you act faulty, chefs always swear, so that's cool. You know, I can get away with that stuff and they drink a lot, so yes, please. And they do quite a bit of drugs too, so that's cool. I can do that. I can be faulty. And then I saw all the work that was involved, and then I kind of second-guessed myself again. And then I saw where the chef school was located. And then I was like, tickets. Because that street back in Durban in those days was like party <coughs> streets. So I was in it for the wrong intentions. You know, I passed high school. I did what I needed to do. And then instead of embracing the gift of, you know, it was very expensive for my parents. Instead of embracing this gift, I kind of saw the party life rather. And um, in I went. And that I just wanted to go back to the school life as well. With all these girls and fitting in in these circles, I saw all these girls having boyfriends and all of that. And I had to get a boyfriend and... You know, I had to I had to tick all the boxes because if you if you go to break and you don't have a boyfriend to talk about, then you haven't made it. You know, if you don't have a partner or if you don't, so I had to get that. And yeah, I kind of I went through that. And when I got out of school, I realised that I didn't really like guys. Um, I went through another phase. I was so lost as a child, like I was going through all these things. Um, and to be accepted, you had to have a boyfriend and you had to have all these things and I didn't have those. Like when I went to chef school, I realized that I didn't really like guys. No offense, but I kind of fell asleep while we were trying in the moment and I didn't really, you know, and my dad said, you need to find a man and you need to do this and you need to do that to be accept accepted and you need to do this to be accepted. Um, that's successful 
and I didn't have all of, I didn't tick all of those boxes. I dropped maths in high school, you know. I thought I was a failure, so I did, I did this chef's thing because I could cook. And then came the rampage of partying. Um, I found where all the, I found where all the clubs were, I found where all the pubs were, and I tried this new, maybe I was interested in girls. And I would never be accepted by society, but that's cool. I hate society, whatever, you know, I went on this rebellion, fuck society kind of rampage. And it really actually didn't do me any good for my future because the more people try to give me advice and say, Taryn, slow down, rather study for this and don't go to the bar or don't go to that party, I didn't listen. And I thought it was cool not to listen and I challenged, I thought it was a challenge when people were trying to show me how to do life. I didn't listen, I thought they were criticizing me. I don't like taking criticism either. So then came this whole in chef school, partying, and then I found my, my drug of choice, which was women, um, and then started the, the girlfriend phase, and then I started dating, and then everything was about the person I was dating. I would I wouldn't acknowledge my family. I would, I would do whatever my partner told me to do because that gave me, that filled the void inside of me. The whole, my whole life story, I've been trying to fill this bottomless void with things outside of myself. And, you know, fast forwarding that, I did a few geographicals. Uh, I put myself in difficult situations. I put myself in dangerous situations. What I thought was fun was actually, now that I look back on it, it was actually, I was supposed to die in a few um, situations that I got myself into. And I was like a self-will run riot, gone mad. Um, I used to have car accidents. My dad used to come to the rescue, quickly put me on a drip before the cops got there because, you know, then they can't test me for alcohol or drugs in my system. He always used to vouch for me and pay the bills you know, sort out the insurance, put that in a nice little neat parcel, and I wouldn't deal with any consequences. I wouldn't deal with any of the responsibility. And I was like in this little bubble of recklessness, just floating around making disasters. That was me. And I didn't have any regard for, I didn't feel any pain because I wasn't exposed to any consequences. And then, you know, the consequences came as I, I chased these, these girlfriends of mine, I moved into the bush, I moved to the Eastern Cape for one of them, and, you know, I worked at a very prestigious lodge, and, yeah, that didn't work out, so, and also through my jobs, when I, when I came into a job as well, I would present this facade of myself. This is where I was also people-pleasing and being very fake. I would say, my name is Taryn, here's my CV, I don't, I drink occasionally, I don't smoke much, you know, and I would present the squeaky clean, totally fake, bullshit version of myself, and then, oh, you're such a great chef, you're so neat, and I would sell this to, like, the lodges and the, the establishments that I work for, give it a month, and I would be dancing on the table in the staff canteen, mad, smoking the stuff that the guys are smoking, in with the gangster crowd, you know, and then I started blaming, like, my first when I moved out, I was in the middle, okay, I was in the middle of Addo Elephant Park at a, a lodge in the middle of nowhere, and I could still find drugs and parties. I was, in, in my life story, I was in situations where you would never expect to find drugs, I could find drugs. Wherever I went, I could find a party, I could find drugs, I could find a way, because I'm thrifty like that, I'm a thrifty addict. And I blamed the places. I said, no, it's because at the lodge, the game rangers party, and they smoke weed, and they do this stuff. So maybe I must get away from them. So I moved to another lodge, but I moved with me. I didn't get it that I was the problem. I would, I would do this, I would do good for, it lasted me, maybe not even two months, month and a half, and then this image of myself would deteriorate, and the mess ups, and the arriving late for work. I used to pass out in my car, 
And the staff used to like knock at my window and say, Taryn, you have to get to work, you know? It was just mad. And I broke my family's heart. My family was like, what are you doing? You know, and I couldn't see it. Everyone around me, my friends, my family was saying, Taryn, what are you doing? And my, my call pass card would just be like, I'm a free spirit, okay? I'll just go wherever, you know, the wind blows me. And I'm just, you know, just leave me. I'm spontaneous. And they're like, yeah, you're spontaneous. And I just cause this... You know, stuff would start deteriorating and, and I'd move to another job and I would sell myself and then I'd start getting late for work again and then, you know, the consequences came. So I just simply did another geographical and I spent two years in the Eastern Cape, then I spent two years at a very prestigious lodge and then I thought, no, it's the bush life. Let me go back to Durban. I went back to Durban um, and well, actually, all, during all of these moves, I moved for my partners. So I moved for the person that I was in a relationship at the time. And I thought, if I was with that person, then I would behave. Then I would behave, because I love them, and I wouldn't hurt them by partying. But I turned off my phone, and I disappeared. And I disappeared from my, my parents. I disappeared from everyone, the face of the earth. And I was just on my own mission. And yeah, it, it really caught up with me in the end because all the accidents, I almost died in a few of them. Um, I, I decided, okay, let me get out the bush and let me go back to Durban and let me get my friends and family back. And I got a really good job at a really high-end hotel. And I tried, and I tried to keep, you know, I was planning a life where I was going to move to Centurion and do the white picket fence thing and have, you know, the, all the suburban, you know, calmness of life because it's the bush that's hectic and I need to get away from the party. <laughs> and, you know, I, yeah, through, I, I totally screwed up. When I went to, when I was working at this high-end hotel, I still, I went out for drinks after work I bumped, my, I bumped someone's car and these people came to my executive chef and they're like, one of your chefs bumped our car. I got into so much trouble and I was always in trouble. And I was like, okay, maybe if I move away from Durban. So I moved away from Durban and I went back to Joburg, Victoria area and I tried. And six months down the line, I found this another shipping job where they also, you know, they go out, the guys go out for drinks after work, and then it just started again. And my, my ex fiance said to me, Taryn, you're, this is going to kill you. You're drinking and you're drugging, and it's going to, and you are an addict. And it really didn't go, it didn't go down well. Because how dare she call me an addict? I don't have a problem. So, you know, that fell apart. And then I had to, you know, like the prodigal son story, I had to come home because my last accident, I was, I had enough and I tried to take myself out. Um, I woke up and I was angry with myself. I was angry with the situation. I was angry for messing up all the time. And I just put my foot flat on the, the accelerator and I went and I woke up, you know, and God saved me again. So... I had to try something different, so I surrendered. When I was 19, um, I had to go to treatment, it's my story. Um, but I messed around there, I set the fire alarm off, I got a girlfriend, uh, did, I did sniff some stuff in the garden. I thought it was a big jaw. I didn't think anything serious of it, like I was dying from a disease, which I didn't know about. And then, after the last car accident, I went into another centre because my parents were worried that I was going to, you know, they were like, please don't, don't die, you know, save yourself, do something. And I went and I tried. I didn't have this fellowship after I came out of that center. And one of my friends said to me, I bet you you're not. I bet you you don't have a problem. And I was, I think I was about a month um, clean and she put a little shot of something in my coffee and I drank it, and I was like, they're all wrong. I don't have a problem, nothing happened. 
A week later, I was like, you see, I haven't crashed a car and I'm okay. And, you know, actually I don't have a problem, so I can go drink. I can go have, and I can go do my, my substances. Two weeks later, I had that accident, you know, and it took me back and it kept taking me back. And I didn't have this fellowship to support me. I didn't have a solution until I was miserable and I had to come back to Durban. And I went back to one of the drugs that really made me feel like accepted. I kind of lied to my parents. Sorry, mom. Um, I told them I'm not drinking and I'm fine. Therefore, they'll leave me alone. But I was taking this other stuff that I was putting up my nose. It was very expensive, very expensive. And I kind of, um, I thought, okay, this is keeping me happy. Then it's cool. I'll make a budget for it and I'll look after it and I'll use responsibly and you know I'll only do one today and I landed up doing three and I was like it's okay it's been a bad day I made excuses for using I made excuses if I was happy I used if I was sad I used if I was bored let's spice things up let's use you know I had an excuse I had to use and it really, my, my money ran out. Uh, I lost almost everything. But in the process, material items, yes, I lost them, but I lost myself again. I was miserable. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't sit down. I couldn't walk. I was restless. I was irritable. I was discontent. I didn't know what to do with myself. And my loved ones and my family didn't know what to do with me. And I said, I'm desperate. Eventually, like the attempts to, the one time I took everything, I took tranquilizers, I took a bunch of medication, I took dog tranquilizers to take myself out. I woke up again the next morning and I was angry at God. I said, God, why are you keeping me here? I'm a waste of air. I don't have purpose for anything. I'm useless. I stuff everything up. It would be easier if I just, you know, made a quick exit that way and left. Because I've got nothing. I just cause crap. You know, and I, I got to my rock bottom where I was desperate to do anything. I said to, I kind of did a step one in a way. I wrote everything down on eight pieces of paper and I gave it to my parents. And I said, I can't do this anymore. I've tried psychology. I've tried psychiatry. I've watched Oprah. I've flipping did the self-help books, I googled at the Chinese teas, I did all that shit. I did yoga, at the morning I was standing on my head doing the hums and all the shit. Nothing worked. <laughs> Nothing, and I'm determined. I'm a determined person. If I want to <coughs> make something happen, I'll make it happen. And I couldn't make this happen. I couldn't stop using. I couldn't do this. And I had to surrender. Because I got to the point where I didn't know what I was doing. And I was miserable. I failed at killing myself. And I really, I didn't really want to live because it was shit. And I felt crap. I couldn't even sit down. I couldn't even do anything. I tried. I took the dogs to the beach. I tried all these self-help things. Nothing worked. So I had to put my hands up and surrender. And that's when I went to lucky number three. Boom. I had to go to treatment again because I couldn't stop. I went to meetings. I didn't understand what they were saying. And they were like making me late for my dealer. I mean, come on. How inconsiderate. Um, you know, and I just couldn't stop. So I had to surrender. And that's where my last treatment center was where I was introduced to the program of Narcotics Anonymous and the 12 steps. And I had to say, yeah, it was a big pull of humility to swallow because I had to say, yeah, I fucked up. And I don't want anyone to know that I fucked up. You know, I'm too proud for that, but my ego had been broken so much that I got the gift of desperation and I was willing to do anything. Really, I had to be broken that far because just things weren't working. No one, nothing was making me happy. And I did my step one. I went to my sponsor, um, and she actually said to me, because I was on all this medication from all these psychologists and psychiatrists, I was on a page, 
And she said to me, you're going to have to come off all this stuff. And I'm like, do you want to see me murder someone? You know, I'll go crazy. I'll go psychotic if I come off. I didn't trust. Still, my ego was there. And still, I didn't trust. And it took me a while. And when I wrote my step one, I thought, okay, yeah, I think I do have a problem. You know, that I was supposed to die here. I was supposed to die there. I didn't connect to the pain. I was in denial. I was delusional, you know. And I, I connected through the help of my sponsor. She helped me to see things. And step two, I had to believe that something had been keeping me alive through all this stuff because miraculously, out of all these situations, there'd always be someone who helped me. And I could have died by that much of a fraction. My last accident, I broke all my four ribs, punched my lungs, split my head open and broke my neck. I was supposed to die, but miraculously I lived. So there's something out there keeping me alive for a reason. And step three, I had to trust that. I had to hand it over, which was difficult because I'm like, yeah, I'm desperate, but yeah, not really. I kind of want to take back my wall. I took back my wall a few good times, and then I got in that pain again. And that's, that pain is the only thing that made me learn. I'm actually grateful for that pain because without it, I wouldn't have come, I wouldn't have gone on my knees and I wouldn't have asked for help, you know. And then I had to clean all the stuff inside of me because I was living through the filter of resentment, anger, all the defects that I saw. I hated everyone and I hated everything and I hated society and I hated them because they were happy and I wasn't. And they were contributing members of society and I was a waste of life. So I was, I was angry at them for being okay and I wasn't, you know, and I had to clear that away. And then I had to, like what I'm doing now is really nerve wracking, but I have to share a message because as much as I think, I thought my past was a wreckage and I didn't want anyone to know about what I've done wrong. And I thought, cool, we'll put a lid on this. No one must know. But with my past, I can help others because they've also been there. They've also crashed the cars. They've also done stupid things for a partner, like move to another flipping province. You know, they've done those things. So I can help people by, by sharing this wreckage. And it's actually a tool. So not that I'm, you know, I'm humbled by my past. Because I'm humbled because I lived through it, you know. And I'm humbled because I've got purpose now. I can help other people by sharing my story. And in the beginning, it wasn't easy, you know. It wasn't easy to share my stuff with everyone else. Because I didn't trust anyone. Because I didn't trust myself. Because I didn't know who I was, you know. And I had to trust in my sponsor. And like a really good friend of mine shared an analogy that it's like a pyramid. You can only see one side and everyone else can see the other, the other triangles, you know? And we need the other people to tell us where we're going. And I thought I could do it by myself. I was fine, I didn't need people. From the time when I was sitting at the desk as a young girl, I don't need people. And I actually do. As much as they, they bring out the defects in me, they also bring out the good in me. And I need the fellowship. I need people to guide me through this. And I didn't want to surrender in the beginning. And it was tough because six and seven, I had to deal with my defects. I'm dishonest. I'm willful. I'm manipulative. You know, I'm all those things. And I wasn't brought up with those qualities. My parents, I was brought up with a wooden spoon. If I, if I spoke back, I'd get smacked hard, you know. But I lost all of that in my addiction, in this constant chase for acceptance and this constant chase for, you know, success and what society expected of me. And, you know, I had to bring myself back to myself and I had to learn, relearn about myself again through the steps. And I can tell you, it's been, it's been beyond my wildest dreams, the most, the most epic thing I've ever done in my life. Because I thought, okay, I have to go to meetings and it's going to... And by applying this program, two things, life isn't boring. 
by being consistent, by being persistent, by showing up, by dressing up, by never giving up, no matter how you feel, things will happen for you. And by continuing that commitment, things started happening for me and I started getting happier, you know, and I started enjoying life for a change rather than being a miserable, angry bitch that I was, you know, because I was. And I had to become honest and I had to become open and I had to become willing. How? Honesty, open-mindedness and willing. You know, I had to try things, even though I said to my sponsor, how is that going to, how I'm making a cup of tea for someone and asking them how they're doing going to help me with my self-pity victim dying swan shit. And she's like, it's going to get you out of that shit. And I was like, fine, let me try. And by going against my head and trying all these things that, you know, that were new to me and these suggestions, that's how I got somewhere. And, you know, it hasn't, recovery isn't like, sunsets and peaches and cream and you go through the hard stuff as well you go through the growth and you have to dedicate yourself more in those times but you have to be honest and you have to be like i've i've built a structure i've become friends with people in the meetings and i reach out to people and only by sharing my stuff with other people can i get help you know recovery for me it didn't open the gates of heaven and let me in. It opened the gates of hell and let me out. It allowed me to live again. It allowed me to be myself again. And it allowed me to have purpose again and find joy in life, you know, where I thought I was, I was not even, I was an oxygen thief. And it's, you know, it's worth it. I can tell you today, sitting here, that going through the hard times, that going against my head, by coming to a meeting when I don't feel like it, by phoning my sponsor, by doing the steps again, I'm on my steps for the third time now, but every time I do the steps, I find a new version of myself, a new layer of myself, a bit of me. And I just, you know, I love recovery because it's something that, that has saved my life. And people say to me, Taryn, you're so strict on your program and all of that. And I say to them, how can I not be strict on something that has saved my life. How can I not be passionate on something that has given me my joy back, that has made me appreciate my life? I'm a better person now, you know? I also have defects, I can also still be faulty, but I've got step 10 to admit that I'm wrong. I haven't gotten, I didn't get the material things, I got the relationships back. My parents have a newfound respect for me, you know? I've got, my, my brother talks to me again now. When I told him, when, when I was an active, he hardly spoke to me because I was a wreck. I've gotten the people that mean a lot to me back. It's more about, you know, and I know who I am. I'm spiritually, I can practice spiritual principles when I have defects of character. And it's difficult. Trust me, I've got a lot of holes in my tongue from biting my tongue when I didn't want to do it because I'm stubborn. And I don't want to be nice to that person, but I'll pray for them. You know, I have to do these things. And then I realized after I do it, oh, that's what she was trying to tell me. So, you know, um, I've rambled a bit at the end, but I had a perfect chair on the way here, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, recovery has opened my eyes and it's helped me and it's, I want more of what I've got. I've done things that I've, I've, I've found the sport that I love doing. I found the job that I love doing. I found the purpose for myself. I found that joy again. And I'm trying each day at a time to just be the best I can be. And if I mess up, I know that I've always got tomorrow to try again and do it again. And I've got the steps and I've got a fellowship. And if I'm having, having a shitty time, I've got friends that I can, I can share my stuff with and I can go to a meeting and I can listen. And there'll always be a solution here. And it's, it's not in my time, because I want things done like this. It's in God's time. It's my higher power, you know. When I act on ego, I'm edging God out. And when I put me away for another day, and I do things that humble me again, then, you know, I don't have to be this person, and I don't have to expect myself to be so perfect in all of this. And I don't let myself down that way. I keep it humble. I keep it simple do what I need to do, and I stop making it about me, and it works. Trust me, it does. 
So, yeah, I'm going to end it off there. And, yeah, thank you for letting me share and listening to my story. Thank you.